Hello, hello! I'm PJ Scribbles, and today I'm going to teach you how to use 3D models, and this will quite literally be your guide to everything 3D within Clip Studio. From character model posing, manga perspective, backgrounds, ways to speed up your coloring workflow, and even some tips for errors you might encounter along your 3D journey. This is a completely beginner-friendly tutorial, so we'll start with the very basics all the way up to the cool stuff Advanced Clip Studio Paint artists use. I've also made a text version of this tutorial if you'd like to save it for later, or if you like to have images that you can pause and follow along with. Alright, stage one, getting started with 3D. Let's start from the very beginning. This set of folder icons is called the Materials panel. Any assets you download or make yourself will be found here. My workspace might look a bit different to yours, but that's just because I've moved this panel to a spot that's easier for me to access. If you don't see the material panel within your workspace, here's how to find it. First, go to the navigation bars found at the top of the program. From there, hover over Window, then go to Material, and click All Materials. This will always open the material panel, so if you ever accidentally close it, you'll be able to find it here. Now that you have the material panel open, you'll be met with different categories of default materials found within Clip Studio. I highly encourage you to click around and familiarize yourself with these categories. Today, we'll only pay attention to the 3D category. If you don't like where the material panel is placed within your workspace, you can always click and drag the panel to a place that you prefer. As you move the panel, you'll see red lines. These show you the different places that you can dock the material panel. Camera movement versus object movement. Now I'm sure you're excited to jump in, but I'm going to stop you for just one more moment to teach you a fundamental concept you need to understand. When you work with 3D for the first time, the action of dragging a model will look the same to you whether you use the arrows, object movement, or drag it with the little camera icons above the model, camera movement. While the result looks the same, these two actions function in completely different ways. The difference between object movement and camera movement is whether the object itself is moving, or the camera is moving further or closer to the object. Let's say I want to bring this bed closer to me. It wouldn't be practical to drag the bed, moving the object, because it will collide with the other objects I have within my scene. Instead, I'll use these camera icons to position the camera. We'll talk more about each icon later. For now, I'll just use these three to change my view of the objects. You can also click and drag anywhere on the canvas to adjust the camera as well. As you work in 3D, you will have to decide whether you need to move objects or move the camera, which is why I wanted to explain the difference first. 3D Model Basics Now that you understand the basics for how 3D models function, let's place a 3D figure onto our canvas. First, click the arrow that says 3D, then click on Body Type. From here, you'll see two different sets of 3D character models. Once you click and drag the model you want to use, it'll place itself on the canvas. The first set of 3D models have very stylized proportions, because they're designed for manga-style illustrations and comics. However, for those with a more realistic style, you'll enjoy the second set of models which have better proportions. When you click on a 3D model for the first time, you'll activate the first set of control options. We call the overall control options on a 3D object the Root Manipulator. Don't let that name intimidate you. <laughs> The Root Manipulator is useful for when you want to change the entire placement of a 3D object, while the regular manipulator options control the individual placement of a 3D part you've selected. On the bottom of the model, you'll notice a set of colored rings and a set of colored arrows. The colored rings control the overall angle of the model, while the colored arrows control the overall placement of the model within the 3D space. The gray outer ring changes the size of the model, and to activate the regular manipulator options, select the body part you want to edit, and then from there, you can freely rotate the part you've selected. If you want to bring up the root manipulator, double-click on one part of the body. Clicking on different sections of the body will switch to that section's manipulator options instead of opening the root manipulator. Here's an example utilizing everything we've learned so far. And congratulations, you've made it through the basics. You should be proud of yourself before you didn't know anything about 3D and now you're on the way to master it. Oh, but something does feel missing. 
Ah, of course. This pose feels a bit stiff. Let's learn how to fix that. Stage two, advanced 3D figure posing. Remember how we opened the root manipulator in the last section? Well, something we haven't talked about just yet are these blue circles called animation controllers. The animation controllers can only move specific areas, such as the line of sight and other body parts. These controllers are helpful when we want to make our poses less stiff and unrealistic. In order to make the pose in our last section's example look less stiff, I'll look for where the, the model's weight will be distributed. Basically, I ask myself what part of this model's body is keeping it balanced. In this pose, I notice that the left leg is where the model is putting the most weight on the ground. Using the animation controller, I'll reposition the hips, slightly drag the model towards the ground, and make small adjustments to give the illusion of movement. Understanding what kind of emotion you want to portray with your pose will determine how realistic it will appear to others. I can take the same general pose and turn it into various poses that tell a different story. Posing the hands. Within the 3D category in the material panel, there's a section that says pose. Within the submenu, you'll find pretty much every hand pose you'll ever need. These are super easy to apply to your 3D model. If you want to apply the pose to both hands at once, simply click and drag the pose onto the model. If you want to apply the pose to only one hand, select the hand you want to apply the pose to and click and drag like before. Let's say you couldn't find the exact pose you had in mind. Let me introduce you to the pose hand subtool. To open the pose hand subtool menu, go to the gray toolbar found at the bottom of the 3D model and click the wrench icon. This will bring up the whole subtool detail menu. This menu is your go-to place for settings and fixing a lot of common errors you'll encounter, so get used to it, because you'll be in this menu a lot. All you have to do is click and drag to change the pose of the hands, and just like before, we could either edit both hands at once or select one and edit it by itself. But did you notice that the hands open and close into a fist pose? You can actually change those settings as well. And along with that, another setting that you can utilize is the lock finger feature to create truly unique and dynamic hand poses. Using them together, I'm able to create this really funky looking hand pose, and they're really just fun to play around with. Pose presets. Clip Studio Paint has many built-in full body poses that you can easily click and drag onto your 3D figure. These are great to use as a base to edit or just to use without any changes. Let's talk about how to save the poses we create in the material panel. On the bottom gray bar of the model, you'll find this register pose as material icon. If you click on the small dark gray arrow, you'll bring up a menu with a few options. For this example, we'll save the whole pose as a material. Once you've clicked on the save poses material icon, you'll be brought to this menu. From here, we can change the material name, image, and most importantly, choose where to save the material. In whatever category you choose, all you have to do is make sure you have that category highlighted in blue. Then when you click OK, it'll save to the location you selected. Keep in mind, when you save a hand pose, it will only save anything related to the hand. So if you made a pose with the arm bent, it won't actually save that data. Organizing materials in the material panel. I tend to check the asset store frequently for all kinds of poses that artists upload daily. In the material panel, it can actually get a bit messy as you download assets over time, so before we move on to our next section, I'll show you some tricks for organizing your materials. If you right-click within the material panel, you'll get a pop-up window to create a new folder. Warning, like a big warning, do not delete folders before the moving the assets you have inside. Since I'm showing you how to customize your material panel, I need to warn you that if you delete a folder with custom assets inside, it will delete everything. So please, please, please move your assets outside of the folder you're planning to delete before you delete. I was lucky to be able to test these scenarios with no real harm, but in practice, this kind of mistake could be absolutely devastating. Now you can easily click and drag materials and place them into the folders you create. To select multiple at once, go ahead and hold down shift and drag them into the folder. It's not always practical to click and drag materials from farther ends of the material panel, so 
with the material you want to move selected, look at the panel found at the bottom of the material panel and click the gear icon. From this menu, you can select the category you want to save the material in. Post detection from images, the technology preview. Another feature within Clip Studio Paint is the pose scanner. You can use images you take of yourself or anatomy references you want to study from. Keep in mind that this feature is in the technology preview stage and it's currently not perfect. With an image you want to extract a pose from in a folder you can easily access, click on the pose scanner icon and let the program process. It currently also doesn't detect any hand poses, but it will move the arms. I found that the best kind of images are the ones where the person is easily visible and there isn't a lot of clothing in the way of the pose. In general, this feature is great to create a baseline to work with when you want to create more difficult poses. Locking the model's joints. A somewhat hidden but useful feature you can use when posing the 3D models is the ability to lock joints. To lock a joint, simply right-click on the part of the body you want to lock, you'll then see a blue square on the model. Some tablets won't give the right input, you might actually activate the zoom using right-click on your pen, so for those with drawing tablets or prefer shortcut buttons, you can also find the lock joint icon down at the bottom gray bar. To unlock joints, you can either click the lock joint icon again, or if you want to unlock multiple joints at once, you can click the second icon labeled release all lock joints. So why would we ever want to lock a joint? Well, locking a joint is useful for when you want to keep one part of the body in the same spot as you adjust other parts of the model, or if you want to control the whole body from a specific point. First, I'll lock the places where the weight of the body will lean on. In this case, it would be the right leg and foot. Then, by clicking and dragging the body, I can freely move it anywhere within the canvas. For any final edits, I'll use the animation controller and regular manipulator controls to fix any areas that seem a little off. Changing the model proportions. The 3D figures are great for pose references, but did you know that you could change the body type as well? I'll be using the manga style 3D models, but you can edit the body type of the realistic ones as well in the same way. Let's take a dive back into the subtool detail menu. Within this menu, we'll be talking about the drawing figure section. The first set of options you see will reset the 3D model completely. And then the second button, register material, will save the body shape as a material. The height slider is actually set to centimeters. So if you have a particular height in mind for the character you're making a reference for, you can set this number by hand by clicking on the numbers and typing in the height you want or by using the slider. As you change the height slider, it will adjust the body's overall proportions together. In contrast, the head to body ratio slider changes the overall head proportion separately from the body. Going down the line of settings, there's a little checkbox called adjust head to body ratio with height. When you change the height using the height slider, the values for the head to body ratio will automatically adjust. This checkbox toggles on and off those automatic adjustments. And for our main event, let's talk about how to change the body type and other settings for the 3D figure. Something that I'd like to point out is the blue highlighted bar next to the body figure. This bar will allow you to switch back and forth between full body manipulation and specific body part manipulation. As you click and drag within the gray square, you'll be able to change the body shape. I recommend having as much fun as possible when playing around with the body shape. It'll help you learn in a way that will stick around for a lot longer than just casually making realistic modifications. By testing the limitations of the modifications that you can make, you'll be able to get a better idea of how you want to plan your body type settings and what to avoid as well. Or you could be like me and create references for horror monsters that will keep you up at night. When you start to adjust specific parts of the body, you might get frustrated with some of those strange warping effects you can get. There's a checkbox setting to prevent this and keep your body within normal proportion called maintain ratio. For that extra bit of control, you can also use the horizontal and vertical arrow icons to either type in the value you want, or you can hold it down to control the body shape and size. Of course, no sane person would want to make the same changes to a model over and over especially if you use a particular body type reference a lot. So let's talk about how to save our edited figure as a material. If you want to save a model as a material, you can do it in two ways. 
The first way is using the register material option we talked about earlier in the subtool detail menu. The second method is using the save body shape as material icon in the bottom gray bar of the 3D figure. Both methods will create a whole new model type and the method that you use to save it is just like we did in the pose presets section of this tutorial. After you've saved a body shape as material, you can either add it to your blank canvas or apply it to models you already have placed on the canvas. Applying a body shape to a model that's previously been placed on the canvas won't actually reset the pose. Stage three, camera settings and manga perspective. Now we're getting into some more fun stuff. Starting out with something pretty simple, some camera presets. Down on the bottom gray bar of the model, you'll see a camera icon called Specify Camera Angle from Preset. Once you click on it, you'll bring up a menu with over 30 different camera presets you can use. These presets are great for those quick and easy references you need to make, instead of having to set the camera by yourself all the time. Though, if you want to position the camera fully yourself, click and drag on the blue camera icons above the model. Each one works a bit differently. The first icon rotates the camera, the second adjusts the camera up and down, and the third icon zooms in and out. In the subtool detail menu, you'll find some more camera settings. This menu is great for the more intricate changes you want to make. Under the section labeled Angle, you'll find another place you can bring up the camera presets shown before and a button to center object. The center object button will set the camera to a position that shows the 3D object you have selected in the center of the canvas. Keep in mind that the center object button won't show up on all types of 3D objects. On screen, you can see as I switch to objects that are connected to the 3D background model I've placed on the canvas, the center object button will disappear. But when I switch to other objects, it'll show again. The perspective slider allows you to warp and create really cool camera perspectives that are difficult to achieve on your own. If you uncheck the link camera advancing slash retreating checkbox, the slider will work very similarly to just zooming in and out. The next slider we'll talk about controls the rotation of the camera. Once you change the camera using the slider, you'll notice the grid or 3D floor will change as well. You're not actually moving the 3D floor or the 3D module itself. Instead, you're just changing the camera's view of those objects. You can also adjust the camera with the different sliders X, Y, Z, just like we did before with the blue camera icons. You won't find yourself adjusting the focal position sliders, and frankly, it's difficult to tell where exactly the focal point is. In fact, the focal point automatically changes as you adjust the camera anyways. Now it's time for the fun part, manga perspective. Manga perspective works a lot like the perspective slider in the camera category, and you might find yourself using a mixture of both to fully get those interesting perspectives. Manga Perspective can take up a decent amount of processing power, so depending on your device, it might be better to just use the Perspective slider. Sometimes you might find it useful to use the Collision Correction checkbox if you find that the pose you're using has arms and legs in a position where they start to collide, though sometimes you won't notice a huge difference with it on or off. Understanding the Settings menu. Phew. Oh my, we've talked about a lot by now. This section is designed for those who either skip to this part of the video or you're coming back to this tutorial later on to try to find something in particular. I hope you find this list helpful in the future as you get more comfortable with all the buttons and settings. I know it's a lot, that's why I've made each description as simple and easy to understand as possible. Though, just before we get into the descriptions, I'd like to note that you can always hover over to anything within the subtool detail menu, and you'll find a short description of the section you've selected at the bottom of the panel. See you in the next part. Number one, operation. This menu is settings for the object tool, and you won't find yourself in this menu ever. For the most part, you really won't need to change anything from here. Number two, Object list. This will allow you to switch between different 3D objects you have selected on your canvas. Depending on the 3D object you have selected, you'll either see extra settings or less settings. If you can't find anything in the subtool detail menu, make sure you have the right object selected. Number three, allocate. This actually changes the 3D object you have selected within the subtool detail menu, and the same functions can be found in the 3D model basics section of this tutorial, and it's useful if you want to type in the values for positioning and size. Number four, camera. Go ahead and skip to the camera section of this video as well for number five, number six, and number seven, which is 3D figure, pose, and manga perspective. Each of them have their own little chapter linked in the description. Number eight, outline. Uh, this changes the outline for the 3D objects, but it's also in the troubleshooting and common errors section of this video. Number nine, shadows. This, will, this is where you'll find the apply light source and cast shadows on the ground checkboxes. And again, it's in the troubleshooting and common errors section of this video. Number 10, 
light source. This is for the 3D object light and shadow settings, and it's also found in a couple different sections of this video as well. Number 11, panoramas. You can go ahead and skip to the panorama section. And for number 12, preferences, uh, this is for troubleshooting broken textures or settings for 3D objects that have physics, plus some display settings. In the rendering settings, you can also turn off the outline of the 3D models and change some lighting settings as well. Stage 4, 3D backgrounds. Clip Studio Paint has many built-in 3D backgrounds that you can find within the 3D category. If you've never downloaded a 3D background in Clip Studio, you'll notice this green cloud icon. All you have to do is click and drag the model and then you'll get a prompt to download. You don't need to reopen Clip Studio after downloading. After it's finished, it should auto-refresh and you can start using the background right away. Once you place the 3D background on the canvas, you can change the camera angle by using the blue icons or by using some preset camera angles. Now keep in mind that not every model you'll download will have preset camera angles. You might have noticed that the lighting is a tad intense in some areas and the doors are completely covered in shadow, which isn't what we want. Within the subtool detail menu, we'll go straight to the light source settings. In this menu, we'll see a big circle with shadows. As you click and drag, you can change the direction of the shadows. After we're satisfied, we can edit the directional light, which is the light that is affected by the shadows we just edited. The ambient light settings are not affected by the shadows, but rather change the overall lighting within the environment. I highly recommend playing with all kinds of colors so you can see what colors work best for your particular goals. Here are some examples for just a few of the cool lighting settings you can achieve. In addition to creating cool lighting effects, if you'd like to create a pop art slash comic style background, there's a few settings that you'll love. In the subtool detail menu, we'll be changing the settings through the preferences category. Click on rendering settings, then we'll apply an outline to the 3D model and I'll actually be setting mine to 100. Go to the box under lighting and then change the method to tune. And that's it! Some 3D backgrounds will have further presets that you can use. Just like the camera presets, you'll find settings for movable objects, doors, windows, etc., or general lighting and color settings. The first hand icon deals with anything from alternative color sets to different versions of the same model. The second hand icon will allow you to change or remove objects within a 3D model. This will become particularly useful when you need to get rid of walls or objects that are in the way. For the third and final hand icon, we can change any parts of the model that have been set to move, so objects like doors, swings, and windows and whatnot. Keep in mind that not every model you download may have movable parts, and in those settings, you'll only see a blank gray box. Stage 5, Primitives. Alright, now that we've talked about 3D backgrounds, let's talk about a newer feature that's been added, 3D Primitives. Be sure to have the latest update, otherwise you may not see them. Under the 3D category, go down to the section that says Primitive, and that's where you'll find all these new 3D objects. Before we get into all the amazing things we can do with 3D primitives, I want to go over some basics that will make using these models much easier. Starting out with these blue square icons above the model called the Movement Manipulators. These icons will show up for every 3D object, however, you'll find them very useful when posing the primitives in particular. You can either click and drag on the blue icons, or click the icon you want to use, and you'll notice that it'll become a darker color. Once you've activated an icon by clicking on it, you can freely click and drag on the canvas to rotate and move the object. I'm sure I know what you're thinking, this might be useful, but it's too unpredictable and frankly a bit hard to control that I might as well use the root manipulator controls instead. And to that, I would say you're right. Except, I might have left out a key element just to let you see the difference between having this feature on or off. This magnet icon toggles the Snap to 3D Models mode. The Snap to 3D Models mode allows you to snap 3D materials to positions, rotations, and sizes of other objects when moved. You'll notice in the example that I have on screen that the movement manipulator now works much more efficiently with this setting on. Okay, okay. I know we've just been hanging out with this boring old cube for too long now, so let's do a quick rundown for all the features we'll use in the next few sections. Number one, a brand new addition to the root manipulator. We can adjust the length, width, or depth using these colored knobs. All of the following settings are found within the subtool detail menu, all under primitive. Subdivisions, show wireframe checkbox, object color, and all the other options below. Making buildings with primitives. 
For the first time, we can make our own buildings within Clip Studio without any external 3D modeling program. How exciting is that? Keep in mind that this feature is fairly new and there will be some limitations. However, we can make some pretty cool stuff. To start us out, we'll make the shell of the house. I want to avoid using too many primitives on one single layer, so instead of making any walls by hand, I'll use cubes. I'll also turn off the wireframe to give me a better view of the model. As we go along, we'll play with the wireframe to create a door and some windows. I have the Snap to 3D Models feature on to help me make sure my objects are lined up and connected correctly. Once we have our base, we'll get on to the windows. I'll add another cube to the canvas, then once I've made it to the correct size, I'll open the Subtool Detail menu and change the wireframe settings along with the object color. This will also help us later on when we start using this house for backgrounds. Before I add in the door, I'll actually change the colors of each part of the house so it's easier for me to see. For this house, I made a pretty simple roof by adding another square on top of the house and then changing the color to a darker gray. I'll make the glass on the door the same way I did with the windows. Everything else from this point is just final touches and small editing. And just like that, we built our first house, but how do we use it for backgrounds? It's completely possible to just use what we have currently to create some amazing background assets. However, there is something that does bother me a tad when it comes to the way we have the model currently. There's no texture. Adding textures to 3D primitives. Before we can start adding any textures to our 3D model, we need to grab the UV map. Don't freak out. It's not as complicated as it sounds. The UV map is the unraveled 2D version of our 3D object. The UV map allows us to create our own textures to place on the model. Within the Subtool Detail menu, we'll go to Primitive and click Export. This will bring up a prompt to make a new Clip Studio file. Once you've saved the file, go ahead and open it. In my example, I colored and labeled each, each of the squares, and this template will help me design and draw my textures for the doors and windows. Making a template helps you visualize how textures are placed on 3D primitives. Keep in mind, whenever you add anything to the back or bottom square, you need to flip the image, otherwise it'll appear, it'll appear upside down. For all the windows, I'll mostly color on the first plane of the UV map. Since I will never be flipping the window around, there's no point in me coloring on that side. However, for an extra bit of depth, I'll take an airbrush and add a bit of edge shadow. When you're making textures for UV maps, you don't have to worry about overflow, since the model will only display the textures that fit within the UV map. But be sure to turn off the UV map grid on the file that you have open, otherwise you'll save the grid to your texture. It is actually possible to click and drag textures onto the 3D primitives, however not every shape looks good with the same texture. For example, when I put the wood texture on the house, it makes it big and distorted, but when I apply it to the sphere and other primitives, it looked a lot better. For this reason, I highly suggest exporting the UV map and adding the textures there. In general, you'll have a lot more control over the results, using the UV maps than you will placing the textures directly on the model. Depending on the model, the texture will either squash or stretch, and you'll have to edit your texture with that in mind. Saving room presets. Now you might know already that you can't save the whole house as an object unless you ha like having a single large cube. No, no. There's something that I learned about 3D primitives that has yet to be talked about before. Saving your house as a template. Before you can save as a template, you need to make sure that you don't have any other layers on the canvas. This is to avoid accidentally saving an extra layer data that you don't want. Make sure you have the 3D layer selected, then go to Edit, Register Material, and click Template. After you save the material, you can just click and drag it onto the canvas. You'll want to avoid attempting to move all of the parts of the house together. As of this tutorial, you can't merge objects, so when you try to ro rotate them all together, you'll just break the model. If you find yourself accidentally rotating the objects, you can open the Subtool Detail menu, then go to Object List, and lock all the objects on the layer. You won't have the option to rotate or move the objects until you unlock them again. Adding multiple assets together. Right then. We've gotten to play with the 3D figures and 3D backgrounds, and for the most part from here, you have all the tools you need to use them together. I have just a few features that you'll find handy as you continue your 3D journey. We'll be talking about the last set of icons we've yet to discuss. From left to right, we have Center Object. This is actually the same button we had in the Subtool Detail menu back in the camera section of this tutorial. Place Model on Ground Level. 
revert model to default pose. This will just reset the 3D figure to their default state, reset model scale, and reset model rotation. For the most part, all these buttons are just used to reset the model you have on the canvas to its default status. However, you'll find the place model on ground level button very helpful. You'll use this button to place 3D figures in chairs, beds, and whatnot. It also helps if you've placed a model too far above or below the ground level. And look at that, we've talked about all of the buttons and settings you need to know when using 3D. I know it's not the most exciting topic, but I hope it brings you some inspiration to start using 3D in your own workflow. The All Sides View Palette. To be completely honest, I wanted to avoid talking about this feature too soon. It would have been better suited when we started talking about making houses with primitives, though I held off because I didn't want you to feel like you needed this feature to get the full 3D posing experience. The All Sides View is an exclusive feature for the EX version of Clip Studio Paint, and it's wildly under-discussed. This feature allows you to edit the models on your canvas from multiple perspectives. To open the All Sides view, go to Window, and you'll find it there. Once you click on it, you'll either see your 3D models or a blank square. If you see a blank square, be sure to select your 3D model layer and then you'll be able to see the multi-view perspective. You'll notice a variety of icons at the bottom of the All Sides View panel. Each one changes some settings relating to the view you have of the, of the 3D objects and the multi-views you have within the panel. The first icon changes the types of views you have presented. The second icon changes the perspective of the All Sides View panel to focus on the object that you have selected. The third icon sets the perspective view in the All Sides View menu to match the canvas perspective you have. The fourth icon does the opposite of the last and changes the canvas view to reflect the perspective view. The last three buttons change some general features. The first, Show Face Border Edge, turns on and off the mesh grid. The second icon auto-syncs the camera on the canvas and the perspective view. The third lets you see the camera position in 3D space, and you can adjust them from there as well. The All Sides view is perfect for when you want to copy and paste multiple objects on a canvas and adjust them all at once. Again, this feature is not required to fully be able to make cool things in 3D, it's just a very cool tool that you can utilize if you have the EX version. Stage 8. Getting more out of 3D. Extracting lines from 3D models. The Pro version of Clip Studio doesn't have a way to extract lines from the 3D models, but there's an alternative way to get comic style lines. Sometimes I'll use this method instead of the extract line feature in the EX version because of how nice it looks. Go ahead and place and position the 3D model you want to turn into a background. After that, right click on the layer and select rasterize. Next, duplicate the layer and name one color and the other line. Turn off the visibility for the color layer because this will allow us to see the lines we create in the next step. With the line layer selected, go to Filter, Effect, and click Artistic. Once you're in the Artistic menu, click on the option that says Lines Only. Once you're satisfied with the result, click OK. Now we have a new line layer, and when we turn the color layer back on, we can edit them individually. I'll be using a gradient map to make the color palette harmonious. I left the asset that I used down in the description, but this method works with any kind of gradient, even the ones that you create using the freeform gradient tool, which I talk more in depth about in my How to Master Reference Layers tutorial. It's up to you how you want to edit and change the 3D background. This is just one example of the endless things that you can accomplish with the 3D background models. Extracting lines from the 3D models, but for the EX version only. Extracting lines from images or LT conversion is an EX exclusive feature. For the most part, it's pretty straightforward. You can either right click and select the option convert to lines and tones, or you can use the extract line icon in the layer property menu. You probably assume that these methods achieve the same results, right? Well, the answer is yes and no. Since most people know this feature for its usefulness in photo bashing for manga and comics, we'll start out with a photo. I took this photo myself of the staircase and it has many different elements such as a tree, some bricks, and the metal bars for the stairs. You'll notice that when I click the extract line icon, it gives me some lines but is mostly black and white. 
Then when I go into the convert lines and tones by right clicking on the layer, you'll get a completely different result. The big difference between these two methods is the addition of tones. For this image, I got a better result using the Extract Line button. Once I was done with the settings, I went to the Layer Prop panel and I scrolled down to find the option Convert to Lines and Tones. Clicking the button through this menu will keep the results that I got from the Extract Line button and won't add any extra tones unless I specifically add them in the pop-up menu. Now I'll have a folder with lines and a white fill. I did this instead of just rasterizing the layer, which would give me a flat image, because of the correction filters I want to use. The first correction filter, Adjust Line Width, makes the lines thinner or thicker depending on what you want to accomplish. The second correction filter, Remove Dust, gets rid of all the random tiny pixels that I don't need. Be sure to have the Remove Dust from Transparency on or this filter won't do anything to the image. If you use the Convert to Lines and Tones option through right-clicking on a 3D object layer, you'll get some extra options that allow you to export the lines as a vector or raster layer. The new options you'll see are Extract Line and Depth, which adjust the line thickness and other settings for the line extraction. In the future, I would like to make an in-depth tutorial on line extraction and how to prepare 3D and different images, but I'd like to keep this tutorial accessible to both users of the EX and Pro version, so if that's something you're interested in seeing from me, be sure to let me know. Coloring backgrounds with AI, the technology preview. So far, I've shown you examples of 3D models with some sort of color already built in, but what happens when you start to use a 3D model that's in grayscale? Better question, what if you're on a deadline and have a bunch of backgrounds that need to be colored within a short period of time? Well, recently I found myself faced with both problems. I was able to make some of the coolest comic panels in my career with this tool, and that's no hyperbole. This tool has genuinely made it possible for me to finish my webcomic project in time. This feature is in the EX and Pro version. I've been using the Colorize technology preview to color my image using the lines that I already have on my canvas to auto-color my backgrounds. This feature gives me a fantastic base to work with and allows me to speed up my coloring process. You first need to have your line art on one layer, set it to a reference layer, and then in another layer below, put down the general colors you want to use. Then you'll go to Edit, Colorize Technology Preview, and click Use Hint Image and Colorize. After you've let the program process, you'll get the result. The first image you'll see is my line art, the colors I placed down, the result, and then some final post-processing I did myself. I can spend more time being creative and less time doing the time-consuming side of coloring backgrounds. All images in this section are from my webcomic Peppermint Occult, which you can find on Webtoon Canvas, and it'll also be linked down below as well. Panoramas in Clip Studio Along with the 3D primitives, we've also got a new 3D object called Panoramas. Panoramas are 2D images that can be rotated in 360 degrees in a 3D layer. You can use them for backgrounds in your illustrations and comics. Panoramas are in the 3D category within the Material panel. You might need to download them first, though. If, for whatever reason, the built-in panoramas don't show up in your folder, try going to the Clip Studio Launcher, click Manage Materials, then click the gear icon. From there, you'll see the option Download Additional Materials, and this should fix the problem. Once you've placed down a panorama, you'll want to open the Subtool Detail menu and change the perspective settings in the Camera category. You can also place 3D figures on the same layer that you have a panorama in. However, you'll need to do some tinkering to make sure that the perspective matches. Panoramas are helpful when drafting and making comic scenes, and I can't wait to see the things the community comes up with this new tool. If you already know how to make panoramas yourself, but don't know how to set one up, here's what you need to do. Go to Layer, New Layer, and click 3D Layer. This will create a blank 3D layer that you can place your panorama image in. Next, open the Subtool Detail menu, go to Panorama, and click Open, and then you'll be able to add your panorama image. Stage 7. Troubleshooting and Common Errors one of the most common accidental errors you'll come across is switching tools while working with 3D. It's so easy to switch to a brush by misclicking on a key on the keyboard or maybe switching tools without noticing. The result is your mouse turning into a red crossed out circle and not being able to edit anything on the 3D layer. All you have to do is switch to Operation, 
Then click the object tool and you'll be able to start editing again. The second most common error you'll come across is broken rotating models, and no, they aren't actually broken. Just like we talked about with the houses made of primitives, you can't always rotate the objects themselves. Instead, you need to use the camera to rotate and change the perspective of the object. You'll come across these kinds of models in the asset store, so that's why I've made such an emphasis on the differences between moving objects and moving the camera. Another error that I've come across that I'm sure has led to abandoned assets and frustrated users is this strange looking black shadow that moves as you rotate the camera. 99% of the time, this shadow is not because the model is broken, but rather a strange anomaly caused by an applied outline on the model. In the subtool detail menu, go to outline and turn off the checkbox. I feel the pain for all of the users who couldn't figure out what the problem was, only to now tell you myself that the solution is quite literally a checkbox away. On the topic of checkboxes, another common error you'll encounter is turned off shadows on a model. Some models rely heavily on shadows to show depth, and if they're turned off, you might think something wrong happened in the downloading process. Again, it's simply a setting you have to turn back on. Another error that I've seen come up occasionally is the gray bar at the bottom of the 3D model suddenly switching from the bottom to the top, and all the camera icons will disappear as well. However, in the last section, we saw the gray bar at the top when creating a new blank 3D layer. So it's not so much of an error, but rather a confusing thing to happen when you're in the middle of working. I've noticed it pops up after copying and pasting a bunch of objects, then hitting the undo button, or when I place down some 3D backgrounds for the first time. To fix this, you can either click on one of the arrows, these arrows switch between 3D objects you have on your layer, or simply click on your 3D objects again. For the most part, you shouldn't come across many errors, and if you do, usually deleting the layer and placing the 3D objects again should fix whatever issue you're having. Or, at the worst, you'll need to close and reopen Clip Studio to fix the problem. If you still seem to have issues, it could be a broken asset that you've downloaded from the asset store, or there's something in the subtool detail menu that's causing a problem. Thank you so much for joining me. If you want to see more of my artwork, you can find it down in the description below. And with that, I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>